Why don't you open up those Bibles to John chapter 12? In John chapter 12, we have Jesus who is uh, coming to the region of Jerusalem, to the city of Jerusalem for uh, Passover. And uh, just kind of give you a couple contexts here. We have kind of the broad context is that we have a nation of Israel who has been in captivity uh, for about a thousand years, you know, they have been uh, under the captivity of the Babylonians. They've been under the captivity of the Medes and the Persians. They've been under the captivity of the Greeks. Then as the Grecian uh, empire broke up and four different armies kind of just owned the area and owned the world, uh, thanks to Alexander the Great and his death, um, we have Israel just kind of just getting just tumbled and rolled through um, occupations from other armies. Now, this is all part of the discipline of the Lord upon them because they had been worshiping idols and uh, would not listen to the prophets. Uh, they wanted a king, and those kings would lead them into immorality and idolatry and not trusting in that living God who led them out of Egypt. And so uh, because of their rebellion against the Lord, their hard heart, their stiffness of their necks, their worshiping of idols, sexual immorality, the sacrifice of their own children to false gods. Um, because of that, and, and God gave them an opportunity to repent, uh, they went into captivity from other armies. And they spent uh, 70 years in that captivity, but then would have other occupational forces uh, for centuries. And, um, and so the latest occupational force would be the Roman army and the Roman empire. And you know they are at wit's end with having this army um, over their nation. And they are looking for the promised Messiah who would come and deliver them and not only deliver them from the army, but actually bring in uh, a time of peace, bring in times of um, righteousness where uh, immorality and wickedness are done away with and sin is judged um, and, and that it's seen that there's judgment, that there's seen that there's justice. Similar to our day, people are crying out for justice and righteousness and Israel had that same cry that the Messiah would come in and bring them into a time of healing and prosperity, um, but ultimately that it would begin with the, the kicking out of the Roman Empire. And so that's the, the nation that Jesus is living in at the time of John chapter 12. Kind of an immediate context for him is that he's in uh, the region of the Mount of Olives, right next to Jerusalem. It's, it's really, um, you know, a viewpoint that overlooks Jerusalem. If you get a chance to go to Israel someday, you're just kind of at a Barnes Butte um, over Prineville. You know, you're at a, a, an, a viewpoint over Jerusalem. And on the side of the Mount of Olives was a little village called Bethany. And that's where Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, lived. And, uh, and we've recently studied that, you know, Lazarus had come up ill and had died. And Jesus comes uh, when it was certain that Lazarus was dead. And Jesus heals Lazarus, raising him from the dead and brings him back to life. It's just an incredible miracle. And so they have a feast there in John chapter 12 um, with Lazarus, the recently resurrected, with Martha, with Mary, and anyone that was kind of there for the funeral. <laughs> and uh, they're celebrating that Lazarus is risen. And, and it was then that Mary came and just poured out her dowry before the Lord and poured out an oil that was worth a, Lord, uh, a year's wage upon Jesus' feet just completely making a statement that Jesus is worth more than anything I have in this life. Jesus is worth more than my most precious possession. He's worth more than my future. Uh, this is all I have, and there's never going to be a moment in my life where something more beautiful will come along or something more worthy will come along that, that I could give my heart and my life and my all. And so she busted open this uh, alabaster jar and poured out this fragrant oil of spikenard upon Jesus's feet and washed his feet 
with her hair. We studied that a couple of weeks ago, but we also know that it was there that there was Judas Iscariot who was just completely offended that she would waste this precious oil on Jesus. Uh, And he kind of led some of the other disciples to say the same thing. Why wasn't this oil spared and sold and given to the poor? It's about 300 denarii's worth. And John commentates on that and says, uh, he says, Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he held the money box and he often dipped his hand in that money box and took money for himself. And, but essentially what Judas was saying, along with some of the other disciples, as they were offended at this offering at Jesus' feet, is they said, Jesus isn't worth this. Jesus isn't worth this alabaster flask. He's not worth this year's wage. But Mary's saying, He's totally worth it. There's nothing better. And that's something that's just stuck with me for the last couple weeks, uh, as there's been different opportunities for me to either share the Lord or consider if I want to open my mouth up about the gospel here, and there may be persecution. Is Jesus worth the hassle? Is he worth the stress? You know, is he worth the time or the, the time in prayer? And of course, it's like, Lord, you're worth everything. You're worth all that I am and all that I ever hope to be. And so, from that evening of feasting in Lazarus's home and Mary anointing Jesus's feet comes what's probably the next day, uh, a Sunday, and it's what we call Palm Sunday. It's what we see as the triumphal entry. And it's in John chapter 12, verse 12, where it says, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Okay, so it's Passover. And Josephus, the, uh, he's Jewish, but he was captured by the Romans during the, the War of the Jews, about 70 AD. Uh, Josephus, a historian, says that around 60 AD, there were about 2.7 million pilgrims that would travel to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. So imagine an influx in a city of 2.7 million people. Uh, and in this case, I would think that it would be about that, that, at least that, because people were actually looking for Jesus. People were hoping to see Jesus when they'd come to these feasts, because he was awesome. I mean, no doubt about it. Uh, Jesus was worth hanging out around just to see what he was going to do, even if you were there for carnal, secular reasons. Okay, so imagine Jerusalem uh, swelling in populations of an increase of 2.7 million people, okay? People from the uh, Galilean area that had watched Jesus multiply fish and loaves and had eaten a little bit of that uh, fish sandwich, you know? Uh, People that had watched him uh, cast out the legion of demons over on the uh, eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, that that demoniac that nobody could tame or, or restrain. Jesus was the one that cast out those demons. Uh, and, and so people coming from all over that had witnessed so much of what Jesus had done, they came, uh, much like the other feasts we've read in the Gospel of John, they came to see Jesus, okay? And they knew he was going to be there. And they thought, man, this is like the pinnacle of the moment in Jesus's uh, ministry that he's coming into Jerusalem for Passover. It's time to just crown him king and let's just let him take over. He is going to rock the Romans world and kick them out of Dodge and it's gonna be the best thing ever. And finally, we're gonna have this utopia. Finally, we're gonna have this time of peace. The kingdom of God will be at hand and we just can't wait to see this. And so there's a lot of... um, Uh, excitement as the city grows in population for the Passover. And so when they come, they all take palm branches. They cut these palm branches. Now, when you go to Israel, uh, there's a lot of palm trees all over. Uh, They don't quite have the dates on them like you'd see a little lower and a little farther east, like in Jericho, but palm branches everywhere. And the palm branch had become a national symbol of Israel, okay? Uh, Imagine our stars and stripes, you know? Uh, Imagine our bald eagle, you know? Imagine our Lady Liberty, you know, or um, the Lincoln Memorial, or something that, you know, when you see some of these symbols, I was gonna make a joke like a red mega hat or something like that, you know, it's like, for people, there's like symbols that you're like, that symbolizes something, or a fist in the air, that's, you don't have to leave, I was joking about the mega hat, Weston. (laughs) 
Let's show you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no mega hats. Can we just rewind a little bit? Okay. You know, but there's these symbols that they mean something. And to the Jews, the palm branch meant national prosperity, nationalism. Okay, Adam also, I said I was joking about that. Okay, um, just so you know, you get up here, you're not safe for under, I'm just kidding, that's the end. Uh, <clears throat> but it goes all the way back to Old Testament times. Uh, it goes back to the times of the Maccabee revolt against uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and the Greeks. Um, <clears throat> it goes to a time when even after Jesus, when the uh, Roman war with the Jews was happening, there was Jewish currency being passed around during that campaign that the money had the palm leaf on it. And, and then even after the Romans beat the Jews, they came back into Rome with Jewish slaves and Jewish prisoners and with articles out of the temple. And they began to pass around for a season coin with palm branches signifying the defeat of the nation of Israel. So kind of just imagine the stars and stripes and bald eagle and Toby Keith and all of those sorts of things. Okay. And, uh, and, but you know, bring it to the Jewish spectrum. Okay. And, um, and so they've got these palm leaves and it means something. They are in a spirit of national pride right now, and they are ready for the long-awaited hero to come and rescue them, all right? Now, think about that for a minute, and everyone use your, your just imagination that God gave you to picture the most incredible warrior, king, uh, you know, the greatest general, the hero, coming into an, a medieval or an ancient city and just use your imagination. What does that look like for you? You know, probably many of us, we go somewhere where there's a, a horse of battle, you know, a war horse, and, and it's a white steed or stallion, and it's decked out for war, and the guy riding it, man, he is just ripped and built and leathered from years of battle and winning battles and I mean, just the guy just has an has a aura about him that just breathes out victory and you're going down, you know? Um, you know, so picture the Humvee, you know, coming into town, you know, and the 50 cal on top and just, a, I mean, just something that means like strength, right? Like, come on, let's, let's see some, some conquering and to conquer, you know? And that's not exactly what they're going to see today um, as they whip out their stars and stripes and their bald eagles, you know? Uh, they, what they see as they uh, begin to shout out prophetic words from the Old Testament, they shouted out, Hosanna, okay? Hosanna, which means save now, rescue us now. Uh, even history of the Feast of Tabernacles, it was common for, it was actually customary for the men and the young boys to get palm fronds and to really strengthen the branches on them with other uh, branches to just have some major flags of palm fronds to be waving. And it was a common thing during like the Feast of Booths and Tabernacles for the men and the boys to be shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna, in the way that it's spelled in the Hebrew, uh, to be shouting out this, save now, save now. And just a little bit out of order, normally that's Feast of Booths, here's its Feast of Passover, you don't need to read too much into that. Here you've got people that are used to shouting out Hosanna. It's something that they look forward to. It, it's the, you know, I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free, you know, and we get all tingly and weepy and all that, and we all get our leather jackets out with our bald eagle on the back, and we're just like, <laughs> you know. And that's the Hosanna, okay? That's just, I mean, people, they're, they're getting the warm fuzzies and the national sentimentality, and, and they're shouting out the known psalms from Psalm 118. Hosanna, okay? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's, it's a welcome in God's name. In God's name, welcome, rescuer. Welcome, Messiah. Lord, when you come to save, you're welcome to come save. They add into that the king of Israel. The king of Israel is coming. Here he is, guys. He just raised Lazarus. He's going to be coming around the corner. And pencil in November 2022, 
okay? Working on a little bit of an Israel trip, okay? We were looking at this year, but COVID kind of slowed things down. So just pencil in your calendar, November 2022, be looking to that because we go to the Mount of Olives and we go and we follow the track of Jesus the night, uh, really the Passion Week, okay? We follow the very road that Jesus rode down on the donkey into Jerusalem, okay? And you can just picture, you're curving around from Bethany, curving down the side of the Mount of Olives, going down into Jerusalem, and the town is roaring that Jesus is the king of Israel. Let's look at the Psalm 118, 25, and 26 uh, passage together, where they're shouting out, save now, okay, that's Hosanna. Hosanna means save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We've blessed you from the house of the Lord. Was that 25 and 26? I don't know if we, okay, sweet. Uh, Okay, so they're quoting scripture. They're quoting messianic psalms. Uh, They're right in their excitement about Jesus. This is a good thing. But their perspective is just a little off, and we're going to see that perspective maybe have a little bit of a letdown in a little bit. But uh, verse 14, it says, then Jesus, when he'd found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Many times you'll uh, read the New Testament and the writers will take from the Old Testament and kind of splice different passages together. So this is a, a splicing of Isaiah 40 and Zechariah 9, uh, where there's these prophecies of Jesus coming in this way. But he's coming in a way that's different than they may have anticipated. It says in verse 14 that he'd found a young donkey and sat on it. John you got to kind of appreciate, just he's pretty straightforward. He doesn't get into a lot of the details that the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke get into of how the donkey was found. Um, You know, there was a mother with its foal, and Jesus ends up riding the foal, you know? And so, I mean, if you could get any humbler, Jesus is bringing the humility, guys. It's, It's one thing to be like, okay, hey, go get me a donkey, And if anyone asks why you're taking it, just tell them the Lord has need of it. And so they bring a donkey and Jesus hops on a donkey and here he comes down the procession, you know, and he's riding a donkey and it's like, okay, all right, all right. (laughs) You know, okay, I mean, the scriptures say that we aren't to multiply horses and think that our strength is in horses and we would be proud about our stallions and our war horses and, and okay, you know, and David rode a donkey and okay, so, okay, all right, all right, get over it. Like he's riding a donkey. But one of the gospels speaks of that he actually took the donkey's baby. (laughs) Okay, so he's like, oh, you thought that was humble? Watch this, you know? And he hops on the foal of a donkey, okay? So if you've been to the McKinnons, you might have met Rita, okay? Rita looks like a baby. I mean, I don't know if that's full size or what. Maybe a mini donkey, I don't know. She's a little tiny, okay? And, And so if I were to hop on mini Rita, you know, it's like getting on a little tiny pony, okay, a teeny tiny pony. And it's like, this guy is breaking the mold on humility right now, okay? He's breaking the mold on lowliness, all right? Not only that, it says that no one's ever ridden this donkey before. I don't know what a saddle bronc donkey is like, you guys. I don't know if you got to, you know, mark out and if you got to like spur its neck because it's coming out of the chute, if you know anything about rodeo, you know, um, but this little thing might have been you know, a little buck every now and then. It's the first time, you know, so Jesus is coming down into Jerusalem, little cloppy cloppies of the hooves and little, (laughs) bring it back. You know, one of the disciples is kind of trying to lead by the neck. He's like, just let go. I know how to do, you know, (laughs) you know, so we just went from General Patton coming in victorious on a tank, you know, to, I don't know what the comparison would be, you know, but but he's coming as Zechariah says, behold, your king is coming. I'll tell you what, that's cardio, pretending to ride a little mini donkey. I don't know what riding a real one's like, if it's that hard, but, um, okay, I think we might be okay. Okay, so, O daughter of Zion, Jerusalem, like, there's hope, okay? Your king is coming, but it's gonna be sitting on a donkey's colt, or lowly, 
and riding on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. Okay, and that may, as they see Jesus coming on the donkey, some may have had their Awana program kick into their brain from their youth, like, oh, I remember the Zechariah 9.9 about the donkey. Others have just got to be a little bit wondering what's up, (laughs) okay? What is happening here? Um, In fact, in verse 16, it tells us that his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, and you might mark that because it's going to come up a little bit later, what power came when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. When they had the Spirit's power in their life, then they remembered that these things were written about him. And we see that in Luke 24. We studied it around Easter Sunday, I think, in Luke 24, that the resurrected Jesus opened up the disciples' minds that they could comprehend the scriptures. And, and, you know, I believe that's something that the Lord does for us today, too, that when we come and we're born again by the grace of God, he opens up our minds that we can comprehend the scriptures. And he begins to show us and teach us that the Bible's not primarily about us. A lot of times we're reading the Bible, it's like, show me something about me and how can I, you know, have a good motivational speech toward myself as I'm reading the Bible. And we begin to see that the Bible is about Jesus and that he is the hero of heaven that came to save us out of our wicked sinfulness and that he is the hope and the savior of the world. And he takes these broken vessels and he makes us something new. And, and really in the story, it's Jesus, the hero, not me. Okay. And so the disciples were realizing as they had watched Jesus rise from the dead and 40 days later, ascend up into heaven, they began to remember, remember when he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey? What was that all about? It was like, I went and got a horse prepared. He was all curried out, had a saddle on him, even put battle armor on it. And, uh, and then we had to go get that donkey. You know, first I thought it was a practical joke. Am I on candid camera here? Um, But then they remembered, well, you guys, you know, he was fulfilling the prophecy from Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine, verse 17. Therefore, the people who were with him when he had called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Remember, millions of people coming into Jerusalem for Passover, people that had multitudes had been following Jesus. They'd watched him heal, and they watched him uh, calm storms and multiply fish and all of these incredible things across Israel. And now they know he's in town, and they'd heard, and he even rose a guy from the dead. He'd been dead four days and he rose him from the dead. His name was Lazarus. Well, we got to go check this guy out. We got to go talk to Lazarus. We got to go see what's up with that. Like, let's hear some stories and some tales. And verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, from the synoptic gospels, we know that when Jesus came into the city, there was such an uproar that the city was shaking. And these Pharisees, self-righteous, religious guys that are missing the boat, they are missing that all those memory verses that they had been sticking into their brain had never made it from the brain to the heart to where they saw that Jesus is the one they'd been waiting for. Instead, they're bitter, poisoned by bitterness that Jesus is getting a following and might kind of remove them from their place of religious prestige. So the Synoptic Gospels tell us that they were just like, Teacher, control your disciples. Get them to be quiet. What is this? This is just out of order. This is an outrage. And as I mentioned already today, Jesus says, you know what? If I were to silence my disciples, then the rocks would have to cry out because of the jazz that's happening in town right now. And so uh, here we have a little bit of another little word from those Pharisees, those religious leaders, but it's among themselves. And it reminds us of back in John chapter 11, after Lazarus rose from the dead, that uh, it's in 11 verse 47, the chief priests and the Pharisees all gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and the nation. 
And so we know that the, the Jews and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, that they had just been like, guys, we've got to stop Jesus somehow. He is getting a following, and we're going to lose our following, and we're going to lose our position. And here, triumphal entry day, donkey going down the road, still quite the buzz, even though it wasn't the war horse that we might have been hoping for. Here, you can just see them like gritting their teeth. Like, you, what, what would you guys do? You haven't stopped him yet. You haven't stopped him yet. See, you're accomplishing nothing. We haven't stopped him. We haven't killed him yet. Look, the whole world's gone after him. We've lost our, that's it. We've lost. We've lost, lost our position and our authority. Verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So this is going to kind of open up some, some beautiful section of scripture here that ought to excite those of us that are not Jewish in this room. So you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm guessing there's not many of us. Um, I know there's a couple because I've seen your DNA results from Ancestry.com. You know who you are. Like 4%. That's pretty good. We'll take it. Okay. Um, but we see here that there were Greeks that had heard about the God of Israel. Now, we know from the book of Acts, chapter 18, 17, that uh, the Greeks and the people of Athens were very religious people, very spiritual. Um, they wanted to hear everything that had anything to do with anything, okay? And they had altars to all kinds of gods everywhere, and Paul's going to speak to them in the book of Acts and say that there's even a tomb that they had to the unknown God, and he says to them, I want to talk to you about the unknown God. It's the God of Israel, the real true God. And so uh, those Greeks, some had heard of the God of Israel, uh, especially no doubt after the time that Greece was over Israel um, for that number of uh, centuries. And so for whatever reason, just like the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts chapter 8 who'd been visiting Jerusalem to worship, or like the Roman centurion Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 who offered alms to God continually, or maybe like in Luke chapter 7, the Roman centurion who had built a synagogue for the Jews, uh, they were proselytes. They were people that had come and maybe were converted to Judaism, but it doesn't seem like that. It seems like they're just more worshipers of the God of Israel. And they've heard about Jesus. Think about this. We've got non-Jews hearing about Jesus. It's a preface for the ministry to the Gentiles, the non-Jews that we're going to see in the book of Acts. I know that seems like a lot. You're like, okay, half of that I missed or nine-tenths of that I missed. But all you got to remember is just be excited that the gospel went to non-Jews, okay? Or else we would be a desperate case, dead in our sins. All of us Scottish, Welsh, you know, Omaha, Cherokee, you know, Canadian, eh, not, maybe not Canadians. Um, anyways, just joking. Definitely Canadians. Okay. How do you dig yourself out of that one, I wonder? Okay. So there's Greeks that were there, and they came up to one of the disciples, they came up to Philip, and they said this amazing phrase, uh, sir, we wish to see Jesus. I love that phrase. That comes to my heart when I come to worship or when, uh, when we gather on a Sunday and we begin filing in to Calvary Chapel that, that it just should be on our heart, the words of these Greeks here of, look, you know, we're not here to see you, Rory. I mean, you're pretty good at the guitar, but that's not, no, I'm just joking. You know, or, hey, you know, there's a lot going on, but it, all of that's nothing. We want to see Jesus. Give us Jesus. Don't give us your ideas or your philosophies or man's wisdom. That's nothing, you guys, and that is worldly and foolishness, and it leads to death. When we come here, we want to see Jesus. Give us Jesus. There's a good old Fernando Ortega song. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And when I'm alone, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. It's on my heart. I sang it at a funeral this week. Give me Jesus. And, uh, and here's what the Greek said. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So verse 22, Philip came and told Andrew and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Andrew, great when you read the Gospel of John, uh, that he was one that would take people to Jesus. That was something that he did. Um, and so uh, Philip told Andrew, Andrew and Philip both went and told Jesus that there's some Greeks out there that want to talk to you. But Jesus answered them saying, 
The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So, Jesus hears of these non-Jews, people from the nations, people from the outside that have a stirring in their heart to see Jesus. And from everything before in the Gospel of John, there would be miracles that would happen. And he'd say, don't, don't go tell anybody. There would be deliverance from demon possessions happen. And he'd say, don't go tell anybody. My time is not at hand. And whenever the crowds would kind of get amped up and maybe look like they're wanting to make Jesus king, Jesus would say, don't tell anybody. My time is not yet. And he'd kind of escape because his time wasn't yet. But now it's the week before his crucifixion, before his resurrection, before he pays for the sins of the world. And now everyone is making great pomp and circumstance about him. And people from the other nations are coming and they want to see Jesus. And now he doesn't say, it's not time. But he's saying, the hour has come. The hour has come for me to be lifted up. And it would be the lifting up of the cross the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. It was the news of the nations wanting to see him that caused Jesus to say, the hour has come. Because it would be soon thereafter that Jesus' death, for not only the sins of Israel, but for the sins of the whole world, would have paid for their sins and taken the wrath of God from them that if anyone believed in him, whether they were Greek, Roman, Assyrian, Egyptian, they would not perish. They would not go to hell, but they would have everlasting life. That's good news for you and for me today. The hour was come for Jesus to be glorified for him to be raised up on that cross. And he tells us a little bit of a, a parable of an illustration where he says, I say to you, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Just this great illustration, those of you that uh, have any agricultural background of, you know, you've got a handful of grain, you know, or you've got one grain seed and it's just so precious sitting there by itself, you know, it's just, oh, you know, look what it can do, <laughs> you know, you can chew on it and kind of make a little homemade gum and that's just so flavorful and delicious, um, you know, you can feed a handful to the horse and then it's gone, you know, or you can take that single seed or the handful or whatever, you might have a couple hundred in the hand and when you plant it, now, forgive me, not a biologist, got like a C in biology my first time, a B plus the second time. Um, but, you know, it goes into the ground and it has to die. There's just this miracle of creation that as it dies and it, it begins to decay, it comes back to life. And Jesus, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it's a symbol of us when we die. We, we die, we're uh, sowed in corruption but we're raised in incorruptible life. And Jesus uses a similar picture to say, you know what, it would just be great if I just hung out on earth here for the rest of my life and kind of did my thing, but it would only accomplish that immediate help. But if I were to die, my, my, the work that I've done, it begins to germinate, all right, and grow and blossom across the whole world and produce fruit to where then you have out of that one grain, a head of grain that has, there's probably some wheat farmers in here, you know, that you might, there's like a hundred grains on the head of grain. I don't know what it is. I would say a hundred, okay? A hundred fold. You had one, now you got a hundred. Plant some more, hundreds more, hundreds more, hundreds more. It's a picture of Jesus where he's saying, you guys, I am going to go into Jerusalem here. I'm going to lay my life down for the sins of the world. And that includes you today. There's hope for you. If you're a sinner, which I think is every single one of us, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death to you, both now and forever, the wrath of God upon you. That's bad news. But the good news is 
that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And that gift of God is that he laid down his life so that his life could produce fruit for the whole world. That if anyone would believe in them, they would not have the wages of sin upon them that leads to death, but they would have the gift of God upon them that leads to everlasting life. And so I ask you today, have you ever received that gift of Jesus by trusting in Jesus, by hoping in Jesus, by resting in Jesus? Have you ever ceased from your own labors and your own works of righteousness and your list of just great things that you've done? You know, well, you know, I accomplished uh, eight grades of education, which I'm pretty proud of, you know. Uh, I uh, was a Boy Scout for a year and a half, you know, and those were some of the fondest memories of my life. And, oh, I'm a registered voter in the good old USA, you know, and I'm a blue state or I'm a red stater and I'm kind of proud about that, you know, or, or, you know, we have a pretty good pedigree, you know, the Rogers. We're quite athletic and we can run far and do a lot of push-ups or whatever. And, and you're just kind of resting in your own pride and the things that you've done and who grandpa was and this and that. It doesn't measure up to nothing before the righteousness of God. What measures up is what Jesus has done for you. And what you have to do is come to Jesus. You guys ever heard from the, Mount, from the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit? What that means is you come before Jesus and you show him this. And I'm like, that's all I got. <laughs> I got nothing. I'm spiritually bankrupt before you. An old hymn says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. It's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of what you've done. It's because you died like a grain of wheat being planted. And through your act of obedience, life sprung to the whole earth. So let life spring in me. Have you ever asked that of Jesus? I have a feeling, because we're a proud people, we're an accomplished people. We're pretty, um, you know, we're self-made men and women, you know, we're workers. We've got legacy. And I have a feeling that when we come to God, we come kind of humble. Kind of, yeah, I get it, Lord, like we need you and stuff, you know. But you've got to come bankrupt. You got to come with nothing but lint falling out of your pockets. And you've got to come before him and say, it's all because of you that I would have any hope. So give me hope. Give me life. Verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Has that same connotation of humility where we love what we've done and our accomplishments and we don't want to let it go, but when we just open ourselves up to the Lord as a blank check and say, Lord, all that I have is yours. All that I am is because of you. Here is my life. Let it be consecrated unto thee. Take my life, Lord. Use it. But if we want to save our life and our reputation and our pride, and I've got my goals and dreams and my career, and this is how it's supposed to be for me, and I'm holding tight to it then you're going to lose it all. It's foolishness. In the economy of Jesus, it's actually making yourself bankrupt before the Lord, all in for him, that actually ends up bringing more life than you could ever imagine or desire. If you love your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for Jesus, you're going to find it. If you flip over to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, some of the verses I didn't have in here today, a lot of them actually. So flip over, it's not too far to the left. Luke is right before John. Chapter 9, verse 23, similar kind of statement there from Jesus about what we call the cost of discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a, a martyr in World War II, a pastor killed by the Nazis, wrote a, a deep book called The Cost of Discipleship. And a lot of it uh, springs from chapter 9 of Luke, where Jesus says to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, 
Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It takes self-denial, death to self to follow Jesus. And it takes a daily willingness to say no to our flesh, to give ourselves the black eye to where our flesh doesn't get to call things anymore and to say, Lord, no matter what it is today, when you call, I will go. When you say to obey, I want to obey. When you say live this way, I want to live that way. And it's a daily practice of a disciple. And then he says similarly there in verse 24, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and himself destroy, is destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and the holy angels. Uh, and so a good word to the disciples there of the cost of discipleship. Verse 26 of our text, John chapter 12 says, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. We're going to kind of breeze here. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. You guys, for anyone that thinks that Jesus going to the cross wasn't stressful, Jesus knowing that he was going to be betrayed by his best friends, and put on trial and murdered and have the prophecies of the suffering servant apply to him, uh, it was something that caused anguish of Jesus. And you can read about it on the Garden of Gethsemane account in Luke's gospel where he was so stressed, he sweat drops of blood uh, because of the, the cross coming in front of him and the separation from the Father uh, for the sins of the world at that point. Uh, and so he says, my soul is troubled, uh, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. It's this incredible thing that Jesus says because he's honest and he's real, fully God, fully man, and he speaks out and says, I'm really troubled about this. And then it's almost like repurposed. Yeah, I'm, I'm troubled about this, but what am I supposed to say? Let's not go through with this. Save me from the cross, the redemption of the world. No, that's the whole reason why I came into it. And then he just senses eyes like flint again. So there's this moment as he's pondering these things about dying like that grain of wheat. Um, uh, it's this purpose that I came. And so he, he, he kind of strengthens himself and girds up his loins and speaks out, Father, glorify your name. Check this out, verse 28. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. I don't know if you're hearing voices, okay? But it's not often we get to hear the voice from heaven. I know uh, Blaine, one of our elders in the past, uh, neat, neat brother and man of God, uh, had audibly heard the voice of the Lord once, um, spurring him on to follow him. And, uh, and here this voice from heaven uh, says, I have glorified it in the incarnation in sending my one and only son uh, to save the world. And I'm also going to glorify in the act that there's going to follow this week through the cross, through the resurrection, through the glorification of the son and salvation to the whole world. I will glorify it again. Verse 29, this is kind of cool. I hope you like this as much as I do. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel of the Lord spoke to him. If you remember Saul of Tarsus before he became Paul, before he became a Christian, if you guys remember Saul on the road to Damascus, and as he's going to Damascus to kill Christians, a great white light shines from heaven, and Jesus shows up and talks to Saul, and Saul falls down on the ground. And I think when, when Saul uh, tells his story later on in his life, he says that everyone else around, um, help me out, it's not super fresh. Uh, everyone else around saw the light, but didn't hear the voice, or was it vice versa? You, you guys know. Similar, you guys are all looking around like, you're the pastor, why don't you read your Bible? I have read it. <laughs> a couple of times, okay. Um, the point is, there's a couple times in the Bible like this where some crazy act of God speaking, manifesting himself, showing up, boom, 
in Jerusalem, Passion Week, all right? Triumphal Entry Day, Palm Sunday, and Voice from Heaven. Oh, I've glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. And everyone's like, is it cloudy with a chance of meatballs today or what, you know? Or others like, no, it was an angel that spoke to him, you know? And, uh, and we know that it was the Lord. It was the Father because he said, I have glorified it. The Father speaking, and I will glorify it again. Uh, verse 30, Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. This is something that's going to be really encouraging to you guys as you have to start living for me after I'm glorified, that you're going to be able to look back and say, remember when he showed up? Isn't it good as Christians to spend time remembering when he showed up? Put yourself out in places where you need God to show up. When we go to Nepal, almost every year, there's times where we're like, oh my gosh, Lord, we totally need you right now. And he's like, I've glorified myself and will glorify myself again. And we're like, that was awesome. And for the rest of the trip, like, wasn't he so faithful that day when he totally showed up? And now, even years later, you can look back and like, oh, remember when he showed up and pushed the fog out of the Redmond Airport, and we were the only flight that got out to go preach the gospel in the Himalayas, and everyone else was socked in. We have an air traffic controller in our church, and he told us the story. It's like, he's so awesome. And Jesus says, you know what? I didn't do that for me. I hear the Father's voice all the time. That's going to be an encouraging thing for you guys. And was it thunder? I think it was an angel. <laughs> you know, it was exciting stuff, okay? And uh, verse 31, we are wrapping it up. In fact, worship team, come on up. Huh. Put myself in the position now because I am the worship team, so. <laughs> oh. oh, now you're really going to do it. Okay, yes, come up. Yeah, I told you to. Get up here. All right. Uh, verse 31, now. now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. You might underline that, all peoples. You guys, this is so important. This is something that Christians miss all the time and we forget. We get so focused on what's happening right here with me and my four kids and my five acres and my uh, irrigation and my cat and my garden and you know, my business, and we're going in debt, and the COVID, and this and that and the other. We just get so myopic that we forget. Clear up in verse 20, when Jesus heard about the Greeks, he was like, it's time. It's time to die for the sins of the world. And now after he spoke about dying, that there would be multiplication like grain, now he says, when I'm lifted up from the earth on that cross, I will draw all peoples to myself. The purpose of the gospel is that all the nations, tribes, tongues, peoples, raise your hand if you're included in the peoples part of the Bible here. Uh, if you're a person, you're a peoples. Okay, it's just the plural is funky. Okay, that's us. As Psalm 67 says, let the peoples, all the peoples praise you. When they know your saving ways, when they enjoy you, when they fear you, when they see you provide for their needs, let them praise you. Let the peoples, all the peoples, praise you. When the people see you lifted up on the cross, dying for their sins, and 2,021 years later, they look back on it and say, he did it for me, he did it for love, he did it that I could be saved and be with him forever, he did it for the world, that causes us to start with a slow clap for him and erupt in praise and say, let the peoples praise you. In verse 33, and he said, signifying what death he would die, that he'd be lifted up on the cross. The peoples answered him, um, uh, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who's this son of man? And Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light's with you. Walk while you have the light. Lest darkness overtake you. Stop asking these questions. Like, you know, I've talked about me being the son of man so many times by now. Just stop acting like you're half blind. You're in the light right now. I'm in your presence. Start walking and following after me um, before I'm gone and darkness is in your face. Verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. You guys can set your things aside and we'll move towards closing here.
You guys want to stand with me? Guys, as you've heard the good news of what Jesus has done, an extra pick in there. As you've heard the good news of what Jesus has done, uh, as he came in his first coming, not to conquer in the way that you would expect, he came not to set up the kingdom of Israel and satisfy their national vision, uh, but he came to make any sort of utopia a possibility by dealing first with the sinful problem of mankind. And that once our sins have been bought and paid for and we've been redeemed and made new creations in him, then the kingdom of God can move in power, even today. And he will come back one day and he will come, the book of Revelation tells us, that he will come on a white horse And he will come conquering and to conquer. And this time he will come not to absorb wrath on his own body, but to dish out wrath on anyone who's rejected him. And so while we live in this age of grace, it's my plea to you today to receive the work that that grain of wheat accomplished for you. To receive the work that as he laid his life down and was buried, he brought forth thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who would also have holiness and righteousness put into their account and also have resurrection life given to them. So if you've never received that today, there's no class you got to take. There's no special chant you got to do, but you got to come to him. You got to hear his voice and come. And you got to come with humility like a little child. Man, those little kids, when they come and they're excited about something, it doesn't matter if they got food all over their face and it's not running down their nose and their pants are on backwards and their shoes are untied. They're just humble before, the, before just like, give me what I want. And so today you can just say to the Lord, I need forgiveness. I got those pockets with nothing but lint in them. Give me your righteousness. Give me your forgiveness. And he will hear your cry today and he will come and he will make his home in you and he will change your life. And so give your life to him as we cry out to him like they did in our text today. Save now. Hosanna, save now. Amen. We'll go about this week with your eyes fixed firmly on Jesus, the Savior of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.